So thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to speak. Um, so the question is, you know, does Omicron signal the end of the pandemic? Uh, the short answer is no, but I hope over the next 20 or so minutes that I can explain to you why I say that. So just an, an outline of what I'm going to cover. I'm just going to kind of recap over the timeline of variants. I'm concentrating on the UK, but there's a similar story um, in all the different countries in the world, maybe slightly different variants at different times. I'm going to say a little bit about viral evolution, particularly around um, SARS-CoV-2, then about vaccines, and then kind of the question of, well, you know, is it endemic? Do we have to, you know, is that the end of the pandemic when it becomes endemic? And then just a summary at the end. So this is um, a plot of the main variants um, over the last 18 months in England, and up to kind of the autumn of 2020, it was effectively what's known now as wild type, kind of the original variant um, of COVID. And then in December 2020, Alpha, which is the 117, um, probably originated in the UK and it started spreading um, very quickly and became dominant in England by you know, end of January 2021, and then gradually took over um, Europe and the US as well, and to a greater or lesser degree in other countries. From spring 2021, we then got Delta, which likely originated um, or was first sequenced in India. That then spread very rapidly around the world. It was much more transmissible than Alpha, which in turn would be much more transmissible than wild type. And that basically went from 0 to 80% share in England in about seven weeks. Um, Delta had quite a long period of dominance, actually. But then in December 2021, Omicron arrived and went from 0 to 80% share in four weeks in December um, in England. And we've seen very similar trajectories wherever Omicron has hit globally. This kind of makes it look like it was all quite uniform. But actually, within this, there were other mutations. So um, in Delta, you had the original kind of B1.617.2 variant. That then um, gave way to a subvariant of Delta called AY4. And then just before Omicron was coming, another subvariant, AY.4.2, was taking over from Delta. But these um, are kind of minor improvements in fitness. So these weren't kind of major differences. They didn't have major differences in severity or immune escape. They were just a little bit better than the previous variant and was taking over. We're seeing exactly the same thing with Omicron now. The original variant that hit England was called BA.1. And then that was being taken over by BA1.1. And now BA2 is taking over in England. It's already dominant in South Africa and Denmark and um, Northern Ireland. So that's kind of what we've seen over the last two years. And the question is kind of, are variants getting milder? Is this a natural evolution towards mildness? And the answer to that is really quite an emphatic no. So firstly, the variants of COVID that we've seen have not evolved from each other. If variants were progressively evolving to escape immunity, you would see a distinct pattern in their evolutionary tree. This is from um, an article. So you'd see this kind of picture if you plotted their mutations. Um, and that is what you see in many diseases. This is um, H1N1 flu since 2009 when it emerged, that's kind of the swine flu pandemic. And you can see that every year it kind of changes a little bit, allowing it to reinfect people, but it's a clear evolution from one strain to the next. However, this is um, COVID and you can see that none of the different strains here are evolving from each other. So as Adam Kucharski, who's an infectious disease epidemiologist um, in the UK, said, you know, Omicron did not emerge from Delta, Delta did not emerge from Alpha or Beta or Gamma, and none of those emerged from each other either. So there's not this kind of sense that we're evolving anywhere. They're just separate strains that have emerged independently. It also matters which variant you are infected with in terms of Im immune response. Um, so what we've seen is that this is kind of a plot demonstrating how um, far apart the different variants are antigenically. So how far away they are from each other's kind of immune responses. 
So the circles of the variants and these squares are actually um, blood samples from people infected with that color strain. So alpha was actually very close to the um, original type of COVID. And that kind of makes sense because when alpha evolved, it wasn't actually trying to escape immunity so much because there weren't, we didn't have any vaccines and there hadn't been actually that much reinfection. So what alpha's advantage was, it could just infect people quicker um, and affect more people. And so that gave it an advantage, but actually had you been infected with the original type, you're actually still quite protected from alpha. The next kind of variants that came along, gamma, beta and delta, all combined um, a combination of some of them were more transmissible, some of them um, were more immunovasive, particularly as um, beta, and some of them were both like delta. So you can see both delta and beta are actually quite far away from the original type um, here, but in completely different directions, right? So beta wouldn't protect you necessarily against delta and vice versa. And then you get Omicron, which was extremely unusual in just how many mutations it had accumulated and then kind of just appeared on the global scene um, without really any warning. And it is, it's very different to the others. And that's why Omicron has a much higher reinfection rate than the other variants, is that actually being infected with one of these does not give you that much protection against Omicron. You get a similar thing when you look at um, vaccines. So these are, um, Moderna is blue, um, pink is uh, AstraZeneca, and green is Pfizer. And you can see again that actually they were all developed for the original type um, of virus, and they're kind of reasonably effective against alpha and gamma, less effective against beta and less effective against delta, and very much less effective against Omicron. And again, you can see that kind of sense of distance. Vax the variants are also not becoming any milder. So alpha was more severe than original type. Um, delta was then more severe than alpha. Um, and yes, Omicron is milder than Delta, but that isn't kind of an inevitability. And also it's not likely that it's more milder, that it's milder than the original type. Um, so um, there was this article that came out uh, last month, I think, basically kind of saying that really difficult with Omicron is that Omicron emerged in a situation where a lot of people had already had COVID, particularly with the Delta um, wave, and there was much higher vaccine coverage. So it's very hard to know how, um, what its intrinsic severity is. So the, the kind of current thinking is, yes, it's definitely milder than Delta, which has been the most severe variant to date, but it's not clear that it's actually any milder than the original variant. And we've seen, you know, really high actually numbers of deaths in unvaccinated settings such as the US over the last month. There's also, with COVID, there's no real natural pressure to evolve mildness. Um, so again, in this article, they said, you know, viruses don't inevitably evolve to call being less virulent. What evolution selects for is those that excel at spreading. Um, and in the case of COVID, most of the spread happens before you actually feel sick. It happens, you know, the first couple of days um, before you develop symptoms, so you have no idea you're sick and you're mixing a lot. And then in the few days at the beginning, and with COVID, you see at the beginning, you get really mild symptoms. So you don't necessarily um, curtail your behavior early and you don't get severely ill for a week or two after infection. And so actually there's no particular evolutionary pressure to change severity because it's not severity that's hampering its spread. Um, nerve tag who are kind of viral, um, virus experts who advise the government's um, advisory science group SAGE, they said um, in their most recent report a few weeks ago that the fact that Omicron is milder is likely a chance thing, that it's an accident, that it happened to find a way of spreading faster that came with reduced virulence. And they actually say that the next variant to achieve UK or global dominance is likely to be just as bad as Alpha or Delta. So we can't rely on the fact that just because Omicron was milder, the next variant is milder. We are um, certainly in higher income countries now, reasonably highly vaccinated, um, and also have high levels of previous infection in many countries. And that does provide protection um, from infection, and it does provide protection 
from um, severe illness and death, which are obviously good things. And they have meant that the, the recent waves have not been as devastating as they were um, a year ago in many countries. But immunity does wane. This is from the UK Health Security Agency. And this is after just looking at the booster dose. But in the first few months, it gives you, you know, reasonable protection against symptomatic disease, 50 to 75 percent. But that already wanes to 40 to 50 percent in months four to six. And even though the efficacy against hospitalization is really high, 80 to 95 percent early on, this also wanes. And so as we keep going out from our boosters, we're going to end up with more and more susceptible people again. And if you haven't had your booster, you're really getting very little protection now from your vaccines with Omicron. And, you know, in a way, the world was lucky that, that we had the booster option. Um, and in the UK, we were lucky in that we'd started our booster program actually um, in September. So when Omicron came in December, we'd already given a booster dose to many of our most vulnerable populations. But it's actually not clear that we can do that again. So when Omicron hit Israel, they offered a fourth dose to um, many of its people, but they've shown that actually um, that hasn't been as effective as they hoped. So the booster compared to two doses created a massive difference. It really did improve your immunity. Um, and shot up your levels of antibodies. But the fourth shot compared to the third shot has not had the same effect. So there is kind of now potentially diminishing returns into how many times you can keep vaccinating with a, a vaccine that was designed on a variant that just doesn't exist anymore, right? We're only gonna get um, further away from original COVID. So in that sense, it's kind of, we need, we really do need kind of new vaccines if we wanna um, keep boosting our immunity. People also talk about um, endemicity. People say, well, it's endemic now, um, we can live with it. Well, firstly, endemic doesn't mean mild. Um, malaria is endemic, TB is endemic in many countries in the world, and they cause very high levels of illness and death. But an infection is said to be endemic when it's constantly maintained at a baseline level without you having to do anything with no restrictions, et cetera. Um, and in some sense, the disease becomes predictable. Now, there's nothing predictable yet about COVID. You know, we've literally just seen the steepest exponential rise ever seen with Omicron in the world. Um, and no one expected it. If you said to people in November, is this what's going to happen? They would have said no, right? And we're now seeing a big exponential fall. This is not endemic. And we don't know what's going to happen next. Um, you know, we talk about and endemicity being inevitable if you don't eliminate or eradicate. And that may be true, but we have no knowledge of how long that might take. Is it years? Is it decades? Is it centuries? So as NERVTAG, again, they emphasized um, a few weeks ago, you know, we have no knowledge of the long-term evolutionary trajectory of human coronaviruses. We just don't know what happens to them. We don't know how the, co the coronaviruses that are cold, how long they took to become cold, how they emerged and what happened. Um, and they also say with NERVTAG, you know, that they remain concerned that a new serotype can emerge for which no current vaccine is effective. So they are still worried that we could still get a new variant of COVID where the vaccines will not protect us. The other thing they highlighted, and I just wanna say this here, is what they call the promiscuity of the virus potential zoonotic crossover event. So what that means is that effectively COVID can be quite good at infecting animals. And there have now been cases where those animals have in turn reinfected people and caused outbreaks. So for instance, there have been hamsters causing an outbreak in Hong Kong um, and mink causing an outbreak in, um, I think, Denmark a year ago. And also that we know that COVID is really common in US deer. And there is this worry that actually, even if it you have a kind of a lull in the, in the human population, it will circulate in animals and eventually cross back over, potentially even more mutated. And that this creates this kind of constant reservoir of disease that, that make us vulnerable to new surges. And the other thing just to remember is that you know, we've called it over after every wave. So these are all examples I'm about to give from, from the UK, but I think there have been very similar ones in other countries. 
So, you know, in April 2020, you know, barely a month after the pandemic began, we had these headlines saying coronavirus pandemic in UK could be over by the end of September. The summer of 2020 was full of people saying it's fine, COVID evolves really slowly, we don't have to worry about evolution. Then alpha hit. Um, we had severe lockdowns in the UK and across much of Europe. Um, but then, you know, things went away. The vaccine was incredibly effective against alpha. Um, even one dose was extremely effective. And then we had more stories, you know, the end of the pandemic is coming. We don't know exactly when, but it's coming. Then, of course, within a month, Delta had arrived. But by July, again, you know, we had a peak. We had really high cases, but it was kind of, yes, the pandemic could be largely over. And this was based on the efficacy of two doses um, against Delta. And then, as we know, we literally just had Omicron. Omicron is now decreasing. We now have the third dose being quite effective against Omicron. But again, there's this narrative, oh, well, now it's over, right? I think this is more to do with humans and our desire to look for, for good news than it is to do with actual reality. So just to summarize, each major variant has been distinct from the last. They have neither evolved from each other sequentially and nor have they evolved to become milder. We've just seen the most explosive period of exponential growth and now exponential decay of the last two years. I mean, SARS-CoV-2 is not yet an endemic virus. And we have no idea how long it will take to reach endemicity. Um, you know, we just, don't, we, we just don't know. And it's not a passive process. We have some control over, over the kind of endemicity that we end up with, whether it's going to be one with a high level of disease or a low level of disease. Um, you know, we have control over our public health systems. Immunity from vaccination and infection do wane on the order of months. Um, we are seeing that now. So for instance, in the UK, most people are now three months out from their booster. Our more vulnerable populations are six months out. So that is a concern because we still have very high rates um, of transmission. We're still seeing new variants and subvariants evolving with um, BA2 currently achieving dominance in many countries, but the likelihood is that the next major variant will not be an Omicron subvariant. And unlike when Alpha and Delta hit, we don't have a vaccine rollout program. Most, most high income countries have kind of reached the end of their vaccine rollout, where they've kind of got stuck at a plateau of a certain number of certain percentage of population being vaccinated. And there aren't any new vaccines being rolled out en masse. There are many in trials, there are many being um, tweaked for new variants, but it's not clear, firstly, how effective they'll be, and secondly, when they'll be rolled out. So finally, just to say, you know, Omicron does not signal the end of the pandemic. There is no reason to think we're, any, we know, we're at the end now than there was after Delta or after Alpha. We are closer than we were at the beginning, but I think that's about all that we can say. If we really want to hasten the pandemic's end, we need to concentrate on the things that we do know work, vaccines, treatments. We know that it's airborne, that's the biggest thing. If we can mitigate against airborne spread through cleaner air, through mask wearing and high transmission settings and so on, that will, that will have a big impact on reducing its spread. Um, surveillance is crucial as we kind of await the next variant. And then once this pandemic is over, unfortunately, um, we do need to prepare for the next one. This is the third SARS-CoV um, epidemic in 15 years. We know that flu pandemics are overdue. We know that climate change and environmental pressures are creating more mixing between species. Um, unfortunately, it could be that the 21st century um, is a century of pandemics. And I will end there.